Hello, it's so nice to be back in my homeland where I'm understood. Um, I'm Jamie Bradley and I am from Emma. Uh, Emma is an email marketing company. Like he said, we're based in Nashville and we have about 15,000, I had to look, I know how many customers we have. We have about 15,000 customers across the spectrum, big, large, um, and we provide the technology for you to make, send, and track email, but we also layer in strategic services. So from the get-go, when you call in, you've got somebody to talk to, there's someone to help onboard you, there's someone that you can strategize with, do design. I'm our customer marketing manager, so I'm Jamie Bradley, and uh, my job is to basically attempt to scale and replicate these amazing one-to-one -one experiences that people are having day in and day out with the people that work at Emma. These are real, they're not stock photos. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty daunting task. And uh, how do I do it? I use a lot of email. Um, email is a big deal, not just because I wanted to put it really big on a slide, though I do like it. Um, email's a big deal because we're spending a ton of time there. Half of you are probably checking your email right now. I'm, you know, I'm a little jealous. Um, but email's a big deal, not just because we're receiving tons of email, it's a big deal because of numbers like this. So we actually conducted a study and found 47% of the respondents said that email was sort of the breadwinner of their marketing mix. And I'm a big nerd and I've been in email marketing for several years and was having to quote an incredibly similar stat from the Direct Marketing Association. So I was excited to be able to put kind of our name to this stat and I was also excited to see that this really hasn't changed. This has been true. Email to ROI has been predictable and more than double that of other digital channels for really the last like eight or nine years, which is really great. Um, which is probably why in that same study, 58% of those people that we also polled, more than half said, I'm gonna spend more money in this channel. And that hasn't always been the case. And um, we've seen sort of the, the loyalty to email ebb and flow. We've, you know, people said it was dead and Facebook was gonna kill it and that, that didn't happen, it's here to stay. Um, and people are gonna spend their money there. That's great for Emma. It's also great for your recipients um, because it shows that marketers are trying to get a little bit more serious about what to do in this space and it is a valuable space. Um, however, as marketers, we know throwing money at a channel does not a successful tactic make. You can't just spend more and expect to get more. So we're gonna spend our time here today really talking through the three areas of focus in your email program that you need to be mindful of. Um, I also want, I, I went, we had a road show recently and I got to go to Austin and, and a few other cities and, and kind of give a version of this presentation. And you know, I was there alongside some other great brands that were talking about the future of email and they were showing these crazy interactive things. This presentation, we won't touch on that stuff. There are some cool things happening in email. This is truly about the foundational truths of what's happening right now, things that you shan't <laughs> forget if you wanna do uh, email marketing successfully. Um, and I like to, to liken email as a channel to pizza. Um, on one end, you've got DiGiorno, lovely. I've eaten it over my sink many times. Um, and then on this other side, you've got the Italian bistro that you, you know, that's owned by this old couple and you'll drive 45 minutes in Texas, like two hours, that would actually be a commitment, um, to get there and you have a glass of wine and you have this great experience. The difference between DiGiorno, again, no dig, love them, and that experience is very small. They're very iterative tweaks. It's the the way that they made it, it's the method and where, you know, the oven that it was cooked in, it's the, you know, quality of the cheese and the toppings and all of that good stuff. And email's really similar in that way. Um, you get, you know, what you, you, you give basically in the email channel. And so today, we're really gonna focus on, again, those three areas that I think matter, which are really just automation, how to segment more effectively, and design. So we're gonna start with design because it's my favorite. So number one, thoughtful email design never goes out of style. And you know, long ago, email design sort of translated to, I mean, like 1990s email design, early 2000s email design. Um, you know, you had a header, if you had a footer that had your address in it, like you were doing good. Um, if you didn't have the left justified pixelated comic sans, like you were an email marketer. Um, and and that's, that's not been true for a long time. When we say thoughtful email design, we really mean paying attention not just to um, what it looks like and if it matches your website and your brand, but actually paying attention to 
human, you know, cognition and how where people are, what they're going to be experiencing. Um, so today in this presentation as well, I learned best by examples. So I'm just going to show you three concrete examples in the results that, that they got in return. So we're going to start with uh, Visit Philly, Visit Philadelphia. Uh, they're the Convention and Visitors Bureau for Philadelphia. It'd be a little weird if they weren't. Um, so Visit Philly came to us and they switched providers and they were like, we send email and we wanna do it better. What, what, what can we improve? And we sat down with them and they pulled up this DiGiorno pizza. It's, it's not offensive. Like, you're not going to look at this and go, like, ugh, what is that's a hamburger. That's not a pizza. It's, it's an email, clearly. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. But when you really get in there, when you really start to scrutinize what's happening with this mailing, um, you, start to, you start to see where, where improvements could be made. And that's really where that, that revenue is coming from. So just right, right at the jump, um, some design provocateurs will say, you know, where you put images doesn't matter. Above the fold is gone. I don't agree with that. Um, I think that that top real estate in an email is still vitally important. Um, we can chat at the booth later if you disagree. But that, that imagery at the top is still important. So as the, you know, Visitors Bureau, they have access to really great images, which is awesome. Our brains process images about 60,000 times faster than they can text. Um, so way to go, this is great. But then it starts to kind of come apart down, down at the bottom. There are tons of tiny little links. We've got a two column design um, in a mobile environment. Over half of all email is gonna be viewed first in a mobile device, especially this time of year. Um, and this is not gonna play well in that space. Also, when you have multiple columns as a designer, as a marketer, you lose control over how those things are gonna stack. You lose control over the hierarchy of, of what you want me to do. Um, which brings me to sort of the biggest issue with this mailing, which is that they don't know what they want this mailing to do. Um, I would say the cardinal rule of email design, um, or just email in general, is if you don't know why you're sending an email, you don't need to send that email. Um, think about it, like in your personal life too. If you, you know, if you draft a mailing and you hit that send button, if you don't have a purpose and an intent, um, that's that's a problem. And so this mailing is kind of all over the place. They're they're telling us every possible thing that could ever happen in Philadelphia. It's overwhelming. Our brains can't process that many decisions at once. We're going to see this, get anxious, click away, um, and so. And then also the other the other biggie. This is actually what it looked like. It just wasn't a mobile optimized template. I would say too, for instance, with Emma, out of the box, it's very difficult not to mobile optimize your template at this point. Um, but this was a a big thing that we had to get get around for them. So we took DiGiorno and we turned it into the Bistro. So here, it's not fundamentally that different. We've still got this big bold image at the top, we've still got their branding, but we took the headline off of, we you know didn't layer it on top of the image, so it's really clear there's a call to action right immediately when you open it. We removed all the text links, which you can't interact with on a mobile device um, at all. You have to pinch and scroll. You shouldn't be really using those um, if, if you can help it or if you know that people are viewing your email on their phone. Um, so we have a button. Buttons are incredibly impactful in, in email design because you can literally tap a button more readily on a device. They also provide contrast, they stand out. Um, there's, there's sort of this isolation effect where you see a thing and you know that that's, you now are trained to know that's a call to action. As marketers, you can also do a lot of stuff with buttons. You can you know, move them at different places, you can test different, call, like different colors, you can test different language. We do button language tests all the time in our own email marketing. Um, so it just provides more control as a marketer. And most importantly with this mailing, it looks great on a phone and they sort of pared down what they want. And they picked 10 things you could do this weekend or 20 things instead of 50,000 things. Um, and so there's focus to this mailing. It, it's more visually appealing. And again, they're iterative tweaks. This is not you know, big, you know, they didn't blow up every everything that they had and, and change their brand. Um, so just from a to B from making those changes, their clicks improved across the board by 20%. And that has stabilized and gone up and they continue to test. They're an amazing, um, very curious client that comes to us all the time with data and, and data points and asks how they can, can improve. Um, and it's great, but yeah, 20% just 
from A to B, from the, the immediate change there in their, in their template. Um, and just to kind of round out the design section, because we didn't have it, I got this email the other day, and I loved it, from Uber. They do great email marketing. And just some, some quick sort of side notes, because the other examples didn't have GIFs or movement. This is actually probably not an animated GIF. It's hard-coded um, into this. But actually, moving, moving images, we're lizards, <laughs> basically. We have not evolved that much. Um, and so we see something moving and we're like, whoa. And so it catch, captures attention immediately, which it did for me. Harmonious two-color patterns. So just, I, it doesn't matter what color this is, but it's pleasant to look at. It pr you know, provides a sense of calm. It also can help with recall, um, just on a subconscious level. And our brains prefer lists. Again, we, we are skimming and scanning. We're busy. Think about where I am. I'm not reading this word for word, but I can see that there's Three th our brains just prefer to break information down um, in that in that manner as well. So easy to skim, easy to scan. Just some additional tips to kind of dial in um, your email and things to try. So we've got our our email design looking stellar. Um, who who are we going to send this to? Um, so number two, segment, target, repeat, and I I am a marketer. I though I work for an ESP, I have to do the same things that most of you guys have to do. I have to send emails to people and get them to do things and buy things and learn more. And people come to me all the time and they're like, Jamie, we need to segment. And I'm like, that is very vague. <laughs> that is, who? Who do we segment to? What does that mean? Um, you know, I know that it's not favorable to send everything to everybody all the time, but more often than not, because email is kind of a workhorse in people's marketing mix, segmentation goes way to the wayside um, and, and often is, I would say, one of the things that is most overlooked, um, which is unfortunate because though we've already established email is a pretty powerful channel um, for ROI, the majority of that, that revenue that people are getting that they say that this is working for them is from targeted mailings. So it's not the batch and blast, it's not the monthly newsletter. The majority of, of the effective mailings that, you know, are coming from, from highly segmented uh, content. Marketing profs, though, our buddies at Marketing Profs found that we are not alone. If you don't feel like you're doing this well, you're, we're in this together, guys. 42% of the marketers in a recent poll said they're not even, they're not doing this. It's, it's too hard. And I get it. We are inundated with data points. It, we, we know too much almost about the people on our list at this point, you know, and you can append data. There's, there's tons of things you can do. If you, you know, all of that data is, is meaningless if you're not actually doing something with it. So we're going to look at one of my favorite examples and actually one that I have emulated in our marketing and helped translate it. Um, so who's familiar with this concept of like a, the escape game? Most of you, right? So if you're not, it's where you pay someone to lock you in a room for fun. Um, I think it sounds terrifying. And, uh, and I thought it sounded terrifying and horrible, uh, all the way to the escape game where I was forced to go on a work team building trip with my colleague, Christina. We did not escape, by the way. You get a really shameful <laughs> sticker, and it's hilarious. Um, so my favorite thing about the, <laughs> the escape game, though, is that I actually had a lot of fun. Like, it wasn't scary. You can, there's a panic button. You can get out. Um, um, and, and they know this. They know this about their audience. And that adage that it's much easier to sell to someone that already knows your brand, knows your value prop, a current customer, you know, those those people that you don't have to win over, that's, that's true across, across the industry. It doesn't matter if you do an escape game or not. Um, and so they knew that, and they came to us, and they were like, we want to get in front of these people that are having a great time. What should we do? Like, what do, we have all this data. We have their email address when they sign the scary release form that says they, they're going to get locked in a room. Um, what do we do with that information? So we sat down with them, and again, they do. They know a lot about you. You sign a long document. Like, they know my address. They know, like, my allergies, food allergies. It's crazy. Um, but you don't need to know that to do an effective sort of retargeting campaign. So we sat down with them, and essentially we just found we need three data points, or really you only need two, and there's an additional one for fun. So we need to know their email address. Easy, we have that. We need to know if they played a game or not. It, that's it. And we need to know um, 
for the purposes of this mailing where they're located because there's different locations. So where we landed is if you're in Orlando, if you're in Nashville or Austin, you get one of these mailings. And what I love about this from a design perspective is that dynamically across the top, um, it has the place that you are. So you're the city you're in. It has, it's kind of hard to see, but the phone number um, there down below, you'll notice these, these sort of dynamic content wells are a little different. These are the games that I didn't play. So um, I, if I you know, did the heist, then I'm like, oh, I didn't even know there was Mission to Mars. That's really cool. And the way it's not a long mailing, so sandwiched in the middle of that is some text and a big old button. And uh, our brains are now conditioned to know that cat, the way that's mashed together, that fall funds a password or a code of some sort. You don't have to read anything. This is, has a nice copy, but you don't have to read it to know, oh my gosh, they want me to buy something because it says book now and I get, I'm get i going to get a discount. Um, and so it's a really effective just visual email. Most importantly, though, the segmentation that's happening in the dynamic content, if I click through the Nashville email, I land on the Nashville specific page and I don't have to think. It's just fall fun is in there. I click the button and I go. And again, this is this is retargeting. This is segmentation that's really effective. And I'm stealing this idea for something that we are doing. Um, and because it translates no matter what you're doing. So just in launching this, in the first month that they did it, they booked 200 games. This was low-hanging fruit. They would not have booked these again just by asking, basically making it really easy for people like me in the moment to get excited again and buy another game. Um, this has now become part of their business model. This, this email series and other emails like it are now a predictable piece of their, their marketing mix and, and they rely on, on these mailings. So when we say segmentation, um, I love this example just being a really practical way to walk that out that, that feels attainable and not crazy. Um, so the last section here, I mentioned automation earlier, but specifically we're gonna end at the beginning and we're gonna talk about the importance of making great first impressions. Um, so that last mailing is, they have automated it. I don't think it's automated right now. Um, automation is another one of those sort of monolithic email marketing words where it's like, you gotta automate. And it's like, what are we doing? What are, why are we doing it? Um, there's you know, broad reasons why. One, it's gonna make you more efficient as a marketer. Two, you're gonna automate because you're more likely to strike me as a recipient when I'm interested. Um, if you trigger that based on my behavior, I'm more likely to be in a space where I'm interested in what you have to say. So we know why we'd automate, but let's look at some examples. First, we're gonna start, though, um, with how we capture uh, capture that data so that we can know who we're automating to and learn some things. Um, so Thistle Farms is a really amazing customer of ours. They're a nonprofit social enterprise, and they make really awesome candles and bath and body works kind of uh, type products. Um, but the entire program is based around the people who make the products and who they benefit are all women who are survivors of human trafficking. So it's this amazing brand. Um, they have brick and mortar locations, but they also do a ton online um, as well. And they've just kind of home rolled this and, and grown it over time. So as they started to get more online traffic, they wanted to rebrand, they wanted to expand, and they wanted to make sure that they were doing as well on the internet as, as they do in person because they have a really great sort of, um, you know, personal story to tell and they go to a lot of events and things like that. So they came to us and they were like, we, we know that email's impactful. The little email that we've done with Emma has been really helpful, but we've got to grow this list. And that's also a thing. I mean, we're, we all go through that where even if you've got a sizable list, there, there's email list fatigue. I saw um, briefly, the, the, or there was a really good talk from our competitor and friends at SendGrid talking about email list fatigue. It's a real thing. It happens to the best of us. And they were experiencing it, and they also wanted, wanted to grow. So just some really quick kind of tactics that they, that they employed. The first one is that you've got to go where people are actually active. So, you know, here... A lot of people forget about their social audiences with the email. They see these things. I had conversations yesterday where social and email sort of live in these isolated 
corners of, of your marketing, and really they are they are buddies. They go hand in hand. You can learn a ton about your you know your social audiences from the email channel, and you can grow your email channel from your social audience. So well, all they're doing here um, is that they have set up a text to join sort of integration, and they just periodically. This is actually. I think they've pinned this tweet, but they just periodically send this out and they just say, hey, if you want to join our list, and they solicit it that way. They're not, you know, I, these options, having that text to join is, is really nice now and it's just a, a good idea to do if you, you're getting a lot of action in this area. Um, the other thing that they did is that, like I said, they go to a ton of events. It's actually kind of how they, they formed and grew their business the first time I learned about them. 10 years ago, they came in and told their story and they sold product. Um, so all they do is they're just taking an iPad app um, and when they, you know, when, when they sell product and they're just capturing, um, capturing emails in, in store, but it is something, you know, that a lot of people do forget about. Um, also, when, during the rebrand, they made this amazing sort of time-delayed pop-up um, and I love it because it's got a picture of women in the program, and they're not asking for too much up front. I mean, we've all seen these pop-ups, and whether you like them or not, they're incredibly effective. Um, they, there's no proof that they really alienate users. You can, you know, click out of this. This one specifically is on a time delay, so on, it's only on certain pages, and it's only after I spend a little bit of time on a page that I get served with this, this, uh, this pop-up. There's lots of different ways to deploy those. And uh, again, they're only asking for what they need immediately to make a good, a good first impression. Um, and lastly, they didn't forget about their static form. Um, you know, pop-ups are very prevalent, but often people do forget that, you know, you do need to have, have these sort of everywhere on your site. So um, just, just giving a shout out for the static form. It's, uh, it's doing work on the back end all the time. Um, so just by focusing on those efforts, just by doing more than this, since February, they've grown their list by over 6,000 people. And really what they were doing, I mean, there's probably some of you sitting out there that are like, I know about this form. I know about pop-ups. Um, you know, again, this isn't groundbreaking stuff, but just really not forgetting about it. And if you're going to do a rebrand, if you're going to do a site upgrade, if you're going to do any sort of um, overhaul, not forgetting and being mindful and thoughtful about these these entry points is really important, and it can it can pay off. And they're growing their list by like a thousand people, like every two months or so, and it's it's really wonderful for them. Um, so once we got all these new people on the list, we had to think through what's their experience right out of the gate um, with with this brand. Um, and so we know in our space that a welcome email, that automated message that goes out and deploys when I give you my information is hands down going to be the most engaged with and interacted with mailing in pretty much everyone's email program. Um, most people have some sort of welcome at this point. Um, and we've sort of expanded beyond that. It's like a one email is a table stake just in email marketing. If you're not doing that, that's your homework today. But a series of emails can actually maximize your, your efforts with just that one, again, that one data point or two data points. Um, so they came to us, they made this, this nice, you know, sort of strategic four point, uh, uh, it went out once every, every few days once someone signed up. The first email, and I'll just kind of walk you through what these are. The first email is just saying, thank you. It's not a hard sell. It's not trying to do anything too crazy. Um, they were, back when they in implemented this, giving away a free shipping. So they were giving something. But it really is just a nice, like, we're glad you're here. The second email um, is actually saying, here's a person's life that you change when you, when you buy our products. And often when I show this example, people are like, well, I'm a consultant. Like, I don't... I'm not like, you know, saving someone from human trafficking. And the point of this is not the type of story that you're telling. It's that you're telling a brand story. It's that you're letting someone know on the other end why they should even pay attention. Why Are you having fun at the escape game? Is your consulting service increasing someone's ROI? This is an opportunity for you to get that message out there and tell people about a little bit more about you. Um, the third email I love, because they do more than just sell products, they have volunteer opportunities, they have a cafe, and this mailing is just sort of letting people know, like, we have events, we do different things, and it's sort of an evergreen piece that just educates. It's also intended um, to be a place where, as a marketer, I can look at this and on the back end see 
what people are clicking on. Um, you can dynamically also, based on clicks, put people into segments automatically. So if I'm clicking on, you know, the the shopping cart, maybe you put me in a stream where you send me more products. So theoretically, that's what this mailing is is supposed to be doing. Um, and then by the fourth email, we're getting bolder and we're saying we want you to be a recurring donor. Becca Stevens is their CEO, and she's saying, you know, join us um, because we've been on four dates to the bistro. So now <laughs> we can be a little bolder um, with, our, with our message there. And so this was working for them. This was a huge success um, when they first launched it. Um, the, the opens and the clicks were astronomical. And it was, it was wonderful for them. And really that lasted for about seven or eight months. And this is the part where you've probably heard this adage, but Automation, or maybe not the way I'm about to say it, but automation is not like a Ronco rotisserie. You don't set it and forget it. You don't just pat yourself on the back and say, we got this thing running, I'm never gonna look at the results. Um, you need to continually check back in, especially at this welcome series, because it is so important, it is such a great impression. It's good to check back in on how it's performing. So we checked in on this and how it was performing, and we'd gotten some great data back from how people were interacting with it, but we noticed that on the third and fourth email, that was a little too long, it was a little too much. We sort of played around with the timing of it, that didn't really change. So we scaled back the content. And while a series is great, you don't have to do a series forever. So now they just send this one email. But the big difference here is that they're saying thanks and welcome, but instead of offering something, they're just they're offering the ability for you to opt in to exactly the content that you wanna receive. Um, this has been incredibly impactful for them because while it looks like they took away or maybe the series failed, what they were able to do is diversify their content and get people faster into other automated streams. So now when I get this one email and if I opt in, I then get put on a different list and a different path, um, which is incredibly impactful. So technically they have one welcome email, but really they've expanded their sort of welcome empire. And uh, this, this email, consistently is getting a 58% open rate and a 24% click-through rate, which is fantastic. I mean, a 58% open rate is phenomenal. It's a little above average for what a typical welcome note is. Um, and that's great. You're like, these are cool numbers, good for them. Um, the thing that I love the most and where we'll end today is that just by making these changes, their open rates for their entire program went up by 30% and continue to stay or stable there. Just by paying attention to how they were automating, making sure that first impression was excellent, and um, learning from that and being you know, unafraid to test and edit, they're putting people where they need to be faster, they're using that automation to its fullest capacity, and it's paying off across the board. Um, and, that is where I will leave you today. You guys have been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we're out there in the, the foyer. Uh, so please come stop by. I'd love to chat with you. We only get better together. So thanks so much.